Uh, today we are with Safi Khazayan, uh, director of the uh, Civilitas Foundation. Hi, Safi. Hi, Walter. Thank you very much for, for taking some time out uh, to, to answer some questions for us. Um, just to jump right into things, uh, tell us what your path was uh, that led you to, to, to living in Armenia today. I've been coming and going to Armenia since 1980. Uh, I was a librarian in my other life, and so you know I'd come and collect books and work with libraries and stuff. Um, after independence, it was like a no-brainer. I mean, if you want to do something for Armenia, as I did, as you do, as a lot of us did try in the, in the U.S. and lived our two lives, on our Armenian life and our professional life, it just kind of seemed like a no-brainer that after independence, if you're going to try to do something here, it's probably if you're going to try to do something for Armenia, it's probably more productive to do it here. So you've been here since? Um, since this go around since 2011. Um, okay, you've worked with uh, Civilitas for a few years now. Can you uh, tell us about the mission of Civilitas, uh, the purpose it serves in, in, in the larger scale of society, and some of the projects that you guys work on? Um, you know, Civilitas was established in 2008 when Bartan was kind of left the foreign ministry. He basically walked across the city and into this building and started. Uh, and the, the purpose of the foundation was is uh, that you can do everything you want to do for Armenia in the outside world. Talk to people in Washington, Brussels, Moscow, and everywhere else. But unless you really get your house cleaned up, unless you really strengthen society, have an active citizenry, have a responsive, not just a responsible, but a responsive uh, public policy process, public affairs process, you don't have a country. And so uh, he established the foundation. I've been the director since the beginning. And we work in two directions. One is economic development, the other is civil society strengthening. Because really, you can't do one without the other, mm -hmm. especially outside of the city. If, if your villages and the, the residents, the citizens, are not solidly grounded in some sort of productive, remunerative work, it's really hard to expect them to be active citizens. Um, so some of our programs in the economic development area focus on the rural areas. And what we do, for example, is sell cows and milking machines to farmers. I say sell because we uh, sell them at cost, no interest, over a 12-month period. It's kind of like microfinancing, right. um, but with a product, not money. Right. And the dairy industry has huge room to grow in Armenia. You don't have to worry about design, about quality control, about all that stuff. You have cows, they produce, you sell, you have net link income. So we help them, we support that. But most of our work is in civil society. We have public forums, like public talk shows, which are kind of rare in Armenia. I mean, there's lots of little conferences, and you invite the usual suspects. But this is something that you know we invite 10,000 people to, whoever, you know, Facebook and all the rest of it, and whoever wants comes. And they have access to important people, ministers, mm -hmm. uh, people in political parties, and they ask questions, and they listen to opinion, and it's a civil dialogue. Uh, we also support libraries and other things. Our biggest new projects, and they're huge, is in the media world. Uh, one of them is polling, which is not strictly media, but certainly related. We do sociologically, demographically accurate, representative polling of Armenian population, asking them questions about social, educational, political issues. We have started a civilnet.tv site, which is news-based, research-based programming. Uh, six, eight pieces a day on economy, politics, diaspora, interviews, trying to make them fun and interesting for your generation, basically, the guys who live on this. And at the same time... Tell us what the Civilnet uh, website is. Civilnet.tv. Civilnet and we've also started a daily newspaper in Armenia uh, because in Armenia there are really two levels of dialogue. There's the elite, the opinion makers, policy makers, and for them a newspaper matters. And then there's the 20 to 40 generation for whom internet news is accessible, mm -hmm. easy, and so we're working, trying to work at both levels. So the purpose is to, to engage that segment of, 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 of people, um, have them informed about what's going on through the media outlets, and also to give them an opportunity to, uh, to express themselves and also to hear opinions of policy makers. Yes. Um, so uh, tell us about your experiences um, as a repatriate uh, living in, in Armenia now, um, as a female working in policy, as a, a um, you know, a person that has a background in the United States working in policy in Armenia. How is that? We don't work in policy in Armenia. In Armenia, we have, you know, government decisions that are either good or not so good. And then we have more and more, thankfully, um, citizens, activists who say, 
this particular event is good, this particular thing is bad, this particular action is bad, and so forth. But that road, that route from public desire and need preference to law is really not charted out yet. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is articulate the questions, whether it's through our annual reports, whether it's through our public forums, or through Civil Net and the, and the newspaper, or whatever, is to try to articulate the questions in a way that people are aware that it's not simply the rightfulness of something that's happening, you know, mm -hmm. a mine, a village, right. a, an environmental issue, a school opening, a school closing. It's not just that. It's the law and the policy before and after that that matter. So it's a hard path. We really don't any of this work in policy. I'm exaggerating. You know, a few NGOs, a few organizations, Alex Sardar, whom we've already interviewed. You know, there are organizations that try, but by and large, there is not that responsive sort of system you don't have people in parliament who say, you know, you, my electorate, what is right. it you want? Uh, nor does he really depend on you to get elected most of the time, and so he doesn't have to listen to what you want. Okay, so let's talk about the importance of civic engagement for the ordinary citizen uh, in a country that's developing like Armenia, um, 20 years old. What's, what's the importance of the average citizen feeling like their voice in government matters? They don't feel like their voice in government matters. How do we change that? Um, by playing at two levels. The obvious easy answer is that elections have to be clean. People have to get elected really on what they've done. And so they must do things that are responsive to your needs. And so you must articulate your needs. And somebody must do a cost you know, effectiveness study of that and see if this country, this place, this nation can really afford that and do it in the way you want to do it. That's at the top level. <coughs> at the other end, the <coughs> sorry. At the other end, the um, knowledge base, confidence level of the average citizen that things can be done, that in fact good things do in fact happen has to change and improve. Information about bad things can empower you to move and act. Information about good things can empower you to move and act because you're now convinced it's possible. But for that, you need good media, and we don't have good media. So some of these, these barriers that exist, um, you know, are they, are they based in like skepticism? Are they based in um, cynicism with the government? Is it, is it like old habits? Um, is it disenfranchisement? Hopelessness, like these are really negative ideas, um, but. And lack of an experiential base. Yeah, there's a lot of everything that you just said, but at the end of the day, neither the Soviet Union encouraged that sort of you know, active citizenry, right. nor does today's system really encourage it, teach it, nurture it. And although it does on paper, although the opportunities are there now in ways that they weren't in the Soviet system, but there's no experiential base that makes that. Uh, so s slowly, as, as small victories start building, people will start buying into the idea that you know activism connected to policy making works. Absolutely. And even if they're small victories, we need to understand here that it's OK that it's a small victory. You know, some of these recent environmental victories, yes, they've been small. And half of the activists and those around them have said, wow, look, it's possible. And the other half have said, huh, it's small. OK, it's small, but it's still a victory. It's a starting point. That's of course, a big of course. Um, OK, so sh shifting, talk about those young people, um, the energized, the, the, the young mobilized uh, groups that you utilize social media very effectively, um, that uh, get active around specific issues, like environmentalism, uh, abuses in the army. Um, do you think that they make a difference? Of course. There's no question they make a difference. The question is, what kind of difference? And you know, compared to all the things that we need and the absence of that kind of engagement. Um, you know, is it enough? Well, of course it's not enough. But these last two years, especially the last year, year and a half, has, has seen a huge surge. And that can only bring them more. They seem to be very high on passion and, 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 and motivated around very tangible uh, issues. Um, but to a certain extent, disconnected from from government, from politics as, as a whole. Um, and I don't know if that's because they feel disenfranchised from the system, as in the system itself as a monolith 
uh, doesn't represent what their views are. So you know, uh, they're, they're going to take to the streets and, and express themselves that way. Um, is that the fault of uh, the activist that says, my power is through my voice, but not through politics? Or is it the, the fault of the political parties as not representing them, uh, or is it both? And the fault of the public institutions that really do not depend on their performance uh, for sustainability or continuity. So it's all of those things. But at the bottom, at the base, is the lack of understanding of that chain and a lack of experience in that chain. It's really not a matter of fault so much as a lack of understanding and capacity um, to turn the very natural outcry against something or for something into a strategy. And we talked about this in our annual report, that the activism has been great, but there's still right. a lack of strategy from outburst and intentions and even successful action to sustained change. Translating that into actual policy. Exactly. exactly. And the, you know, it's interesting that you stress politics because people think that's a bad word. It's a good word. Mm -hmm. Politics means you give and you take in order to achieve what you want. Right. But that process is, is, is non-existent. It's corrupted in a, in a very fundamental way. Because the politicians aren't interested in, in representing? Do not, in fact. Their constituency are, is not their electorate. Um, so how would you assess uh, political parties in Armenia today? Um, the government parties, coalition partners, uh, opposition parties, um, ex-parliamentary -par uh, opposition parties, how would you assess the way that they operate, that the way that they work, and the, uh, the ideals that they represent? Um, first of all, the idea of ideologically based parties is still rare in Armenia. The Tashnakstun obviously is that party because there's you know, a whole tradition and history and I of ideology, and it was easy to build on that. Um, the re and the Communist Party, of course. The rest of them are, all of their are uh, principles and uh, political leanings. They really are not driven by their own ideology. They're driven by individual mm -hmm. politicians and those around of personalities. As a result, they don't act as in the way that we think political parties ought to act, in the same way that the whole polity doesn't. Because again, you didn't join because of an idea, and you don't necessarily have an idea in common with the guy sitting across the table from you. So that's one of the problems there. The other problem is that um, the idea of politics has been so delegitimized, both by Lenin and, and all of his buddies and you know, up to 1991, and even since, it has not shown itself to be this honest, rewarding power game, obviously, that where at the end, the concern is the common good in the way in which you see it, but at least the common good. So that doesn't exist there either. So from both ends, there is a, a, a serious uh, capacity problem. And the other thing that makes all of that even worse is that to the extent that, of course, there is some give and take in politics and the, among the political parties. All of that is done behind closed doors in the sense that there's a governing mm -hmm. coalition. So the two, three parties that really have something to say about the situation do that behind closed right. doors instead of in the open in parliament. And so even when there is some of that political partying, you don't we, see it. We, we, we've seen some outrageous things that have been exposed by Sir Littletoss, by, by Yogi Media and in parliament, of the way things operate. And hopefully that sort of shedding light will, will, will maybe shock the public into, into realizing. Absolutely. Um, okay, so Civiltas just published the uh, annual report for 2011. Um, it's a great read. On uh, It's available on the website. It's available on the website. Um, and the best part of it, can I show you the best part of it? The best part of it is this poster in the back, which is a visual representation of the Army and Budget. People love infographics, and this is a love great it. one. Um, love it. And and it's it, very it, interesting. It shows the, the percent growth and, and, and decrease in, in all the sectors of the Army and Budget. Actually good. I did, I did, it's a great read. Uh, so it's called Without Illusion, which I think is a very appropriate uh, title given the last year of um, Armenia's uh, politics and, and, and foreign policy also. Um, one of the, the most interesting uh, parts that, that, that I found was the analysis of Armenia and its neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the report, um, it mentions that Armenia lacks an ideological anchor in foreign policy. 
Um, can you explain a little bit about that? And also, uh, what needs to change with regards to, to Armenia's foreign policy and its um, relations with its immediate neighbors? The problem is that we do things for what we think a good reason. Uh, we vote this way or that way because we think that's what we need to do for our national security. When I say we, I mean the Armenian government and its representatives, you know, the ambassadors, the foreign minister, and all of that. And nobody questions the intent. Everybody defines their responsibility and their responsibility to God and country and all of that in the way in which they do, and that's you know, respectable, and I accept that. Until we articulate those reasons, the thinking process, the gains and the losses, However circumspectly, because that's what diplomats do, until you do all that, it isn't clear to your neighbors or to your allies or to other people in the international community why you did what you did. Armenia is in a very precarious situation, not just geographically, you know, which we've right. all been told since we were born, but politically, geopolitically, this is a very weird neighborhood. Changes every 10 years. And we're sitting here holding a very limited deck of cards, and we play them in the most creative way we think we can, and then we don't explain it. And so people look at us and say, oh, well, you know, you voted that way because Russia did. Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe we voted that way because um, you voted that way because of Iran. Well, perhaps, but perhaps not. Perhaps we voted that way because of what we thought Azerbaijan was going to do vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It's really complicated. You've got to talk about it. And we don't have that experience of contemporary geopolitics. You know, we either know Armenian history or we don't, or we think we do. Or everyone thinks they do. Or everybody thinks they do. You know, and then it stops. But the issues that are on the table for Armenia today in these 20 years have been horrendously complicated. And you've got to talk them, explain them, debate them, so that you, as representative, can go to wherever, Strasbourg, Brussels, Washington, Moscow, and say, I'd love to do what you guys want me to do, but see all those guys? They're never going to let me do it. We don't use that. We don't use that public podium um, instrument that a democracy has. Um, the next two years are going to be extraordinarily important and interesting in Armenia's politics, uh, parliamentary elections and presidential elections. Um, what should we expect? Look, I don't know. I hope good things. I hope improvement. It, but I think that my better answer would be to explain why we call this without illusions and how it affects your question. And that is that 20 years later, I think and I hope that both Armenians in Armenia and Armenians in the diaspora have figured out that all of those illusions that we had, you know, heaven on earth, tomorrow morning, you know, all of that stuff isn't going to happen by itself no. or in 20 years. It just isn't. And unfortunately, in the diaspora, we don't have that experience of nation building. You know, we even either live in the Western diaspora where Countries run more or less just fine, except you know for the last couple of years in Europe and the U.S. I don't know what you guys have done. This is not good. Um, but but you know, Kishaving, the country runs without me. I'm not engaged in everyday politicking. I'm involved if I want to be, if I choose to be. Otherwise, it runs. You know, the sewage system runs. Uh, nobody invades me most of the time, and you know it runs. Or I'm an Armenian in the Middle East, where if I wanted to, I couldn't get involved in the country's politics. And then we have Armenia, where if you don't get involved, if you don't roll up your sleeves, if you don't participate in the give and take all the time, it's not going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Yeah. And then, now, if it was anybody but you sitting in front of me, somebody would say to me, oh, but Salfi, we come, and then, you know, we get screwed, and this, that, and the other thing. My problem with that answer is that, you know what, a whole lot of people get screwed here. Not just diasporans. It's a place where the system doesn't work, and a lot of people get screwed. You want to work and live here? Do it and fix it. Beautiful. Um, Okay, we're talking about the diaspora. Where should the diaspora be? Here. Um, that was quick. That <laughs> Here. Was, that was, that was, that was Here. Quick. And I don't necessarily mean that uh, nine million of us should pack up and leave and move. I don't mean that. I mean, it'd be great. I was going to qualify it by, by, by saying physically and mentally. Where yes. should we be? Yes. Here. It, and that does not mean that you forget all of the other causes and the communities and all of that. But at the end of the day, if there's going to be sustainability in a postmodern diaspora, not in the diaspora that lived isolated in each of its little countries and went to Saturday and Sunday school and you know the kids learned to sing and everybody was happy. I don't mean that. In this postmodern diaspora, where you can be in five places at the same time. Oh, the world's a tiny place. The world's a tiny place. Your friends cover the globe. Uh, your life is as global as it can possibly be in LA. For me to expect you to be 
interested, engaged in Armenia without being here in some form, physical or mental, is an absurd expectation. To expect you to support this country's needs in Washington without your being somehow grounded in this place is an absurd expectation. And that disconnect is not a good thing. Sometimes our lobby is disconnected from what happens here, and that's not good. Uh, what does that mean, being here? Hell, between you know, all of the you know, high-tech possibilities and comparatively cheap travel, pick a something and get your teeth into it here. A little cause, a little home, a little porch, a little garden, a little, a little something. Get you, make this a real place, not the place that your parents dreamed of, not the place you sang about at camp. Mm -hmm. It's a real place, folks. Treat it that way. That doesn't need any, any addition. Um, 2012 is New Year. Um, what are Saudi Bagdadian's expectations for, for 2012? And what gives you hope? What gives me hope is my young staff. Um, they're younger than my kids, for crying out loud. And um, they believe, they still believe. They're trilingual, they've got great degrees, and they work hard, and they still believe that what we're doing, for example, through media, you can make a change in this country. So they give me hope. The other thing that gives me hope is, you know, when I look at everything that's going on around us in this region, we're not doing that badly. We constantly criticize ourselves, thank God, but if you criticize yourself and say this is hopeless and throw it in the water and I'm going home, that's not good. If you criticize yourself and look around and go, hmm, look at that. Look at what they did. Look at what Georgia's doing with everything it has. Their GDP has just barely exceeded ours. Azerbaijan, if you take out the oil factors, they're below us. Sure, there's hope and possibility in what is being done here. There are incredible good stories of individuals, organizations, companies doing incredible good work, global, world-class work. There's no reason not to be hopeful. Awesome. So part of our job is to spread that hope yes. and to get people here. Yes, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Bobby.